Good evening out there, or good morning or afternoon out there, wherever you may be. Uh, you're in China, I guess it's morning. Uh, but anyway, uh, I just mentioned that because I've got family that's working in China right now, so therefore maybe they're listening. So anyway, this is Michael Cross here with another episode of Unlock the Door Radio, where our motto is Question Authority which is uh, one of my most fa favorite quotes from Benjamin Franklin, you know, founding father. And he's the one that said that a true patriot is someone who questions authority because ultimately if we don't question things, then we're just going to stagnate. We will have no progress. And those people who want to keep us in the dark will just keep doing their little thing in secret and behind closed doors and, uh, and, you know, I don't think they have our best interest in mind. So anyway, tonight we have, again, after a few months, um, we have back on the show, Freighter X. Hey there. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, tonight's show, I want to really deal a lot with uh, Noah. It has nothing to do with, well, it sort of has, does have something to do. They're going to release this Noah movie here in the next couple of weeks. And, um, you know, I, I get this feeling it's just going to be one of those Hollywood things and it's not going to touch on deeper matters. People who have done studies uh, into esoteric writing and ancient history and so forth. But, Freighter, you, you have an interest. You brought this up a lot in our last interview. What is what is so different about Noah that you think maybe this movie coming up is going to is really not going to touch upon it? Well, first of all, there, it's there's so much surrounding the whole Noah, Noahic. They call it the Noahic tradition, the traditions surrounding Noah. I mean, you look at the many. There are many actually. There are many initiatory rites that are based on the ritual is based on the the story of Noah and his sons. And the officers in the lodges of these rituals are Noah and his sons. There's one degree called the Royal Ark Mariner, which is totally, you know, it's an ark, a Royal Ark Mariner, Mariner. I mean, these, it's all nautical, nautical terms. And the, the, the head of the lodge is, is, is Noah, you know, the commander is Noah. And it's all uh, centered towards this, the story of Noah. Why is the story of Noah so important? Because, well, first of all, it marks, I think, the turn the turning point from what what many have called the golden age of humanity, which existed before the time of Noah, that led to the fall of humanity through the infiltration of the, the fallen angels or the watchers coming down and, and breeding with humanity and defiling humanity based on the Bible and other extra biblical books. But then the aftermath, the after the flood time period. So it's before the flood and after the flood. This marks a, a huge pinnacle epoch in the human history on earth you know and, and so this it, why is it so important because so much happened there the time before the flood humanity i believe stretched back far greater in history than we've been taught there's a book out there called uh, atlantis and the kingdom of the neanderthal written by colin wilson which is about a hundred thousand years of lost human history and it basically gives you a whole different perspective. And if you think about it, if a flood was to occur, or a, a worldwide flood was to hit at any time in any development of human civilization or otherwise, it would basically, if it was worldwide, you know, say like thousand foot high, t uh, thousand foot high, uh, you know, tsunami type waves and greater that passed up, you know, over mountaintops and crossed continents and wiped out putting a silt layer of mud and muck on top of everything, you would see the complete erasing, erasure of human culture, probably. And the people that survived, if any survived that, would be a mishmash of people that would basically be trying to, you know, create structures out of the mud left over from the flood, if you will. And it's, so you could see like a, a worldwide, almost species-wide amnesia effect that might occur and then people would have to rebuild from that point forward thinking this is when civilization began. It answers a lot of questions when we think about how the culture of Sumer just seems to like appear out of nowhere in our in our cultural history. Sumer just rises up out of nowhere from a time before when it's like 
wandering, traveling Bedouins, you know, wandering Arabs, to like civilization with 16 digit mathematical equations and, you know, flat ziggurat pyramids and all this social structure that uh, a city and civilization would develop over, you know, over time. But it seems to just appear out of nowhere. Well, that's because it didn't really appear out of nowhere. It's just that the existence and remnants of these other cultures was wiped out, maybe in a flood, you know. But so why Noah? Why is Noah so important? You said, what's the what's the significance that we're not going to see in the movie? Well, I mean, Russell Crowe is is playing the main character, and I've only seen a seven minute long preview, you know, a little clip from the internet, you know, YouTube, and. Uh, he doesn't have, bear the, the likenesses that are described in the books that are extra biblical texts, like, for example, uh, the books of Enoch, Jasher, Jubilee, and the book of Noah itself. And in those books, you got to remember that Noah is in a line of people that go back to this one one patriarch named Jared. Jared was the father of Enoch. We all have heard of Enoch, and we'll talk about him as we go along. But Jared was, his name means born in the, the time of the descent. The time of the descent was, in fact, the descent of the fallen angels that are talked about in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 says, When man began to multiply upon the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of heaven, the sons of God, saw how beautiful the daughters of man were, and so they took for their wives as many of them as they chose. That's Genesis chapter 6, 1. And, you know, that's the pretty much, a, there's about a, there's a handful other references to the Nephilim in the Bible, but that they don't really elaborate much on what is going on there. Now, if you look at these extra biblical books like Enoch, the book of Jasher, the book of Jubilees, which they don't fully exist, those two books, either does the complete Enoch, but they, there are fragments of them that exist. And there's also the book of Noah. And in these books, they talk about how Lamech, who was Noah's father, when Noah was born, he was troubled. He went to his father, Methuselah. We've all heard of Methuselah. He was the oldest human in history, lived to be 900-something years old. Now, remember the timeline, okay? So the time of Jared to Noah. Jared was the father of Enoch. Jared begat Enoch at 162 years. Enoch begat Methuselah at 65 years. Methuselah begat Lamech at 187 years. Lamech begat Noah at 182 years. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. So from the time of the flood all the way back to Jared, when you add it all up, is 1,196 years. That's how long the fallen angels were on earth, supposedly, according to these books, defiling humanity. And we know that there's extra biblical accounts of uh, the lost books of Eden, which talk about the, the brotherhood of the serpent and the Nephilim, the fallen ones, being there in the garden and that there's a, uh, an account of the rape of Eve, which supposedly according to Jude Jerusalem, uh, Jewish tradition is how Cain was created. Cain being the first murderer in humanity, that he was actually the offspring of the fallen angels who bred with, with Eve. And then he kills his brother, who's the real son of Adam, you know? And, and so there's that. And then he, he connected with the fact that, um, during this 1,196 year, you talked about a eugenics program, an ongoing breeding program. Well, it turns out that during the time when the fallen angels are here on earth, according to these old, ex, old extra uh, biblical texts, they were doing all kinds of nasty business with all life on earth. And there was a lot of genetic experimentation in the form of you know, crossbreeding between species going on at this time. And people were, for example, Enoch was warned to not engage in this and to keep his children and offspring pure of this. And so at the time of Noah's birth, Lemek was very troubled because he looked at his offspring, his child, and saw that he had white, white alabaster skin and fiery white eyes and white wool-like hair, which caused him great consternation to the fact he went to his father, Methuselah, and said, what's going on here? I'm, I'm concerned. I think that my child may be a child of the Watchers. And Methuselah was very old and very wise at this point. He went, he said, you know, hold on. I, I've actually, I talked to Enoch about this, you know, ahead of time. And, and, and he, he foresaw and he told me your offspring was very important. As a matter of fact, your offspring is the most important for humanity. And that he was so special, his, his, his bloodline, his, his people, he would be, the, the, the patriarch of humanity. So don't worry about it. All is according to plan. All is well, you know, but wow, doesn't that make you pause, Michael, and think to yourself, what's, what was that going? What was that statement there? What was the, what was it that Enoch 
had had given to Methuselah, you know, that he gave to Lemek as far as a foreknowledge of the of what was to be for human the human species after that time, right? Yeah. Well, I noticed in our in our last interview where when I put it up on on YouTube, there were some people uh, who made comments that you know, like ah, oh, you got to read your Bible and this is all this that or whatever. But I would encourage people to realize that. The Bible itself does not really describe Noah's time, but yet we assume all of us, you know, going through church and stuff, at whatever point in our life, have seen Noah depicted as like this Santa Claus in a like a Bedouin uh, style robe, you know, with his donkey or something out in the middle of uh, some Babylonian field. And in reality, we the description that you know if you read these ancient texts and you realize what they were doing was playing with genetics i don't know what the movie noah is going to present as maybe showing a city or something but in my personal opinion i look at these pictures of of uh, cities in like the middle east like dubai or shanghai in china you know those magnificent glistening buildings, you know, very technological. It's my opinion that this is probably what society looked like at this time. You had a population I've heard in like Jewish tradition or something that was at least 35 million people. And that, you know, if they had technology, then in a sense, this explains a lot more. I mean, this could be where the whole Thing about Atlantis really comes from then. I mean, this is just a tradition that's passed through. You know, the one thing about the movie that we might see as a little bit accurate is the depiction of these, like, you know, barbaric hordes all <laughs> running around like warlords, and, you know, there's a real sort of a fearful anxiety to the whole, you know, let's kill Noah and take the ark kind of mentality going on. There's mob rules. I mean, I when I think of the time, I think of like Conan, you know, the stories of Conan from Robert E. Howard. Not the movie so much because they didn't they didn't do the books and stories justice, but the the old stories of Conan from Robert E. Howard, the time period that he it's almost like middle earth time period of tolkien it's mm -hmm. this sort of like mythical prehistory of humanity and where it's like there's magic abounding with wizards and you know really weird stuff going on like the in conan it's the temple of set and you know the tulsa doom and all the the these serpent worshipers you know and and they're engaged in what seems to me cthulhu like you know uh, ritualized uh, in engagement between creatures from from beyond and humanity, and and you know you can really get that same lore throughout. If you, I mean, if you look at these books like the Book of Enoch, they really talk about that. They talk about how the fallen angels who came down, they didn't just take wives and just take wives. They took on students and pupils. They taught them the dark arts. They taught them weird black magic and all kinds of strange things that that have survived to this day. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that what people don't realize in these ancient accounts, okay, the ancient account of Enoch tells us the watchers came down from the heavens, they took the wives from themselves among the human women, right, and they made unions with them and they bore heroes, monsters, and giants of old. That's what the scriptures says. And the story goes on further to describe that the infamous flood of human genetic memory as being a method whereby the Elohim, the plural, by the way, right, Elohim, cleanse the earth of the fallen angels and their offspring, the Nephilim. In these accounts, we learn that the offspring who were defiling humanity left and right, that was why God deemed them as it's all gone, it's all wicked, but only, only Noah and his sons. All other flesh was fallen except Noah and his sons, right? Well, that's an interesting purific, you know, whole genetics program mentality going on there. The Watchers and, and Humanity enjoy, see, the, the Watchers and Humanity enjoy a special status as part that we are humans of Earth. The Watchers come down. They breed with us. They make another offspring called the Nephilim, right? The Nephilim are half earthbound human, half divine watch or you know, watcher, whatever that is, right? So the combination of the two gives them this their their 
their divine and their temporal and human status. Therefore, uh, this is all in the book of Enoch. According to the uh, the book, upon the destruction, which they were destroyed by God's avenging angle, and then the flood came and wiped out anybody who they couldn't find. After that happens, their mortal bodies perish, but their spirits live on in a demonic half-life, bound to the earth in endless purgatory. It's as if these disembodied entities that we are find throughout all of our cultures talking about evil spirits that haunt humanity, plague humanity for millennia. Well, maybe that's what these are. And according to the Book of Enoch, that is, of course, exactly what it is. But it's just quite remarkable to think about. And what's the connection? Well, these evil spirits are like cousins to us because they're half, they're from half human origins. You know, and think of all the weird stories we've heard, like H.P. Lovecraft type stories, you know, and uh, where these evil spirits trick humanity and enslave and, you know, cause all kinds of horrible tragedies to occur uh, from their influence. So there's that aspect to it. But that's kind of a digression from what we started talking about, which was the, the whole idea of the state of the life that was going on around Noah when he's busy building. I mean, Noah was thought of as a, the, the only righteous man in the world, the one righteous one, the last pillar, you know, and his offspring, of course, inherited the same mantle. But of course, let's consider if all flesh was fallen except for Noah and his offspring, and if that, if that didn't include the wives of the children of Noah, then they did in fact have that Nephilimic infestation brought back into the bloodline by by, you know, taking on wives after the flood, if that's what happened. Or even if they did it before the flood, because according to Scripture, before the flood, all flesh was fallen except for Noah and his offspring. Well, one, so. thing, I would, one thing I would encourage people, like, again, the ones that are sitting there going, oh, my gosh, you know, that's not what I heard in Sunday school, was first of all, there's some stuff in there that, I mean, for one thing, just – most people have never realized they haven't read it for themselves. Uh, he didn't take two animals. He took seven, except for the unclean animals, which he took two. Um, so the depiction, like it looks like in the previews of the movie coming up, is you know two animals of each kind, and that's not what it was. In the Bible, it clearly says that. We also don't know how many sons and daughters and so forth Noah had that actually probably just thought, you know, dad's wacko. I mean, the guy's 600 years old. We can assume he had lots of kids. I mean, not just three sons. I mean, one every 200 years or something. And the other thing, I mean, if they're going to choose an actor that's going to portray Noah, I, I'm just trying to think of someone who would be a platinum blonde uh, male lead. Or, you know, maybe that guy that used to play in the Flash Gordon series back in the 30s or something. Yeah, or, uh, you know, re resurrect the, the Dolph Lundgren uh, from the Rocky movie there, you know? <laughs> oh, my gosh, you know, it's actually true. You know, you, <laughs> Dolph back Lundgren the... would have been a better choice for Noah. Yeah. <laughs> well, as far as going, you know, following that theme, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's quite possible. I mean, you know, so basically, though, to, to bring it back to, to, to what, we're, what we're talking about here, I mean, is we didn't learn these things in Sunday school. And that I myself, I was a good Catholic, raised as a good Catholic growing up. I didn't even realize because I never read the Bible at all. I didn't even realize that Noah was part of the Bible. It was a cartoon on TV, you know what I mean, to me. And it was something that was mentioned maybe at church. But it wasn't. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like I, I didn't make that connection for myself until, you know, I grew up and started looking at things as an adult and, and reading the, the scripture because I began to realize how important, whether you believe it or not, whether it's a, something you consider to be uh, truthful or accurate or, or whether you're, a, you know, an atheist or it doesn't matter, our culture, our species is affected by this material. So it's important to review it if for nothing else to have a greater understanding of what is impacting all of our lives, all of our laws, all of our social institutions, our constructs, everything that we have is structured around this moral compass of these, these, oh. these main uh, religions that are based on the scriptures of the Bible, you know, uh, Islam, Christianity, and, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Judaic laws. Well, you know what's so interesting. What's interesting is that one of the arguments I've heard people make against the Bible traditionally has been, oh, there was people living to be 900, 600, you know, come on, that's ridiculous. But you know what? Now, this is one of the reasons why I say we probably had a 
very advanced society technologically in those eras because we don't know why they lived so long. But we are now coming into an era in which these lifespans are no longer something that you can scoff at because, I mean, you, you, you talk to any of these kinds of uh, Ray Kurzweil type people or something, and, and they'll all say that immortality is not out of reach of humans humans anymore. I mean, we have such things as nanotechnology that may be able to expand our lifespans, well, pretty much indefinitely, unless you get hit by a bus. Uh, I, I interviewed someone, a, a transhumanist, uh, uh, last spring, and she was saying that you'll be able to replace your body, put your brain inside of, you know, something, a, a synthetic body. I mean... It is interesting that after the flood, God's record is saying that, you know, the human lifespan is 125. But yet Noah and his family and all of his contemporaries, we can assume, live these remarkable lifespans. There must have been some reason why they lived so long. And if there was a golden Atlantean sort of age where, you know, people had advanced just a little bit more than we are now, that could explain it. And then, therefore, we wonder, what are we doing today in labs and stuff around the world, mixing human and animal genes, chimeras, you know, for research? I mean, that's documented, mainstream news. You know, you give humans this opportunity, they're going to go wild with it. Don't you agree? I mean, you know, maybe those chimeras that we see in Sumerian paintings, you know, where they all are the same no matter where you look, um, maybe those are based on the memory of what used to be. Sure. And, you know, let's, let's bring it back to some points you made at the start of what you were saying. You talked about the Bible and about um, the authenticity or veracity of the Bible per se, or whether you believe, uh, you know, whatever you might believe about the, the Noah tradition, but story of Noah and things of this nature. You know, when you go back in history, right in our own uh, Western culture, uh, in the 1850s, or I think actually 1830s, I believe, was when they discovered the, uh, the ruins of the ancient city of Nineveh in the southern sands of, of what is modern-day Iraq and Mesopotamia. And when they uncovered those the, the ruins of Nineveh, they, they found the, the library of Arshabinapal. And inside the library of Arshabinapal, they found the cylinder scrolls and texts and references to books going back, you know, till the, he, he claimed this great, you know, neo-Assyrian conqueror, Arshabinapal, he claimed to be able to read the angelic text, the original writings, you know, and was just like a real, uh, you know, the, the basically the cosmopolitan of his age, you know. and But basic the real point of what, what was found among those texts and they were the original seals cylinder seals like uh we've heard about now that they rolled out you had a, a marble or hard rock cylinder that was reverse relief carved with an image that when you rolled it across wet clay it would transmit it would transmit that message and image because it would be cuneiform text so there'd be like literal transmission of signal code through image and text of the message a completely perfect system of data storage lasting thousands of years because it was from 3000 years before you know before common era and it was found in the 1830s right so this this uh this this ability to transmit which far surpasses our own digital technology today i don't think would be able to last like that in the sands of iraq <laughs> to be able to just be fired up and transmit the code right away the way you can with the cylinder seals but amongst those cylinder seals was the original story of the Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest tale of human account that we have on record, and the Enuma Elish, which was the Epic of Creation. And inside the Epic of Creation was this Sumerian, Neo-Assyrian version of creation, the telling of the tale. And it talked about Noah and the flood of Noah. Of course, he was called Ziasudra in there, or Utnapashim was his name in the, in the tale of the Neo-Assyrians going back to Sumerian. But in that story, Noah, basically, uh, it's the same tale. You talked about the animals being brought into the ark. You know, the, the, the commercial shows that uh, typical Hollywood, like all the birds are flying and it's, you know, the, the sun's parting through the clouds. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. Right. But in the accounts of the Sumerians, which they, you know, predating, by the way, predating any Judaic account of creation uh, that's found in the 
Old Testament, right? Genesis. So in the older version of the Sumerian tale, they talk about only collecting the seed, the genetic material of the animals and plants too. The wheat and the you know the material that they used for bread and for for uh, malted beverage for alcohol and also they uh, uh, it was a goat like creature and uh, another animal that they they kept the it wasn't all the animals of the world it was the ones that we they were eating <laughs> you, know, you know the ones they lived off of and the ones that helped uh, you know for their domestication so that's that's just a, a tale of creation and a tale of the Noah story that preceded the Bible and simplified the verse, you know, so the Bible story, it's got Noah taking one of each animal, you know, two of each animal, you know, and putting them on the ark, logistically impossible. <laughs> you know? But in the old account of the Sumerian, they were contained in, in clay containers, the way we've told, we were told that Adam was formed out of clay, you know, and then the account of creation in the Sumerian talks about the mixing of the genetic material of the male watcher, the fallen, you know, the ones who came down with the female egg of the of the human hominid that they were breeding with. So, I mean, it's just it's just for people with an open mind, it, it, it's very clear that the one tale preceding the other and simplified verse simplifying the, simplifying the story is it's, it really goes a long way. It's remarkable in 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 understanding or decoding the story within the story, if you will. Well, if you think about it, I'm just thinking maybe those people. If you had an oral tradition, I mean, I wrote, you know, I sent you some some of my manuscript to the uh, sci-fi that I've written on uh, Noah, Noah's time. It really doesn't deal much with Noah. He's just a contemporary in this in this society, but it's a very genetically obsessed society, and they have the ability to create. I mean, you you could create hybrids of people. You could do anything. I mean, someone loses an arm, you can replace it in a year. You just clone it and all these other things. And it's with the question of how far would we go if we had the ability to do everything genetically? Um, I gave it a, a title. I hope, you know, it is kind of a copy, poor man's copyright, but, you know, I call it destiny of our past. And hopefully I'll get it out there. But um, the, the thing is that nowadays, and if you talk about this 100 years ago, people would have looked at you funny like, okay, this is mythology. They're, they, put, they put the seed in a container. But nowadays, come on. I mean, how many thousands of children right now have been born by taking um, – I mean, there's, there's so many women out there that are virgins with kids. I mean, there's many of them that are lesbians. They've never had a relationship with a man, but yet they go in for artificial insemination, IVF or whatever. And they have babies, you know, or someone who really is, you know, never had sex with a man and they go in for IVF. But what do you do? You take the egg cell, take sperm cell in a dish, you freeze it in a container, and then you put it into a human being. I mean, maybe this is technology that, you know, these people were trying to describe what happened 6,000 years earlier during the flood. You know, if we, if we assume the flood was around 12,000 years ago. And again, in our time period, it should sound plausible if we put technology into it. But 100 years ago, people would have thought this was total nonsense because how can you put seed of one animal and another together in a container and it form into a human or an, a goat or a whatever? Nowadays, I mean, come on. We don't know what Monsanto's doing with goats and humans or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's scary thought right there. I mean, you know, frankly, you're, I, I agree with you, Michael. And, you know, but I also think that you might consider that as far as han animal hus husbandry and, you know, horticulture goes, that we've already been doing this for generations, for, for centuries, as far as, you know, uh, selective breeding programs, just because we don't have laboratories or haven't had laboratories set up doing it. We've been doing selective breeding of animals and plants forever. I mean, as far back, you go back to the beginning. I mean, we were, we were doing it back in the stone age they were separating crops and or or at least isolating different variants like killing off the other things by 
by picking mm-hmm. out the other stuff and only giving the space to the one crop, that crop now thrives, and that's the one you want. And so that's the selective breeding in and of itself. And so it's it's not that far fetched. It's not that hard to imagine. Uh, anybody who's been to a farm, my whole life, they've been doing breeding of cows. They bring frozen bull sperm in. They put on a giant arm glove and mm-hmm. they go right up in the female cow and they inseminate them with bull sperm. Mm-hmm. I mean, they do that all the time. They've been doing that for a long time. So it's, it's only, it's, it's only recently like that farm in Utah where you've been able to breed a goat, which has spider genes inserted yeah. where the milk production gene should be. Yeah. Now that is some scary stuff that goes to a whole different level. Now that's where you're talking about though. I don't, I, it's not hard for me to imagine because see, for me, I'm not, the average person might not consider that we're actually in a state of devolution, not evolution, that we've been duped. This whole idea of evolution, this whole idea of the progression of humanity going along a long span, going from more simpler form to more complicated form. It's, it's from my perspective, that's been, that's a bill of goods, a paradigm that's been set on us to limit our possible, uh, the perception of what's plausible, what's accomplishable, what's of the probable what a person can accomplish i think that we used to be smarter before and i think the evidence is clear when you look all around i mean even in the last couple hundred years you can see where literature in and of itself if you read material from 100 years ago that sure isn't james patterson <laughs> that sure isn't judith Kranz i'm reading you know the only, they, thing this was the, the only thing you have to do is go to a walmart <laughs> yeah right i just you, you know what i'm saying so mm-hmm. so from that perspective you know, we this this whole idea of us traveling down this linear progression of of development, it, it it's it's blown out of the water by any evidence that might go around that or might present uh, unsolvable conundrums. You know, <laughs> you know, like well, like the Baalbek uh, platforms out in the middle of the desert with the the largest stones in the world that are put together like tinker toys, you know, but, but we can't even move them. <laughs> so somebody did this, but we don't know how it's like that violates the paradigm. And yet we're, we're, it's, it's, it's constantly we're, we're being, we have been trained uh, for a long time to stay within the scope of what is possible based on the defined parameters. And that's what we've been already talking about in this conversation is that when you step outside the defined parameters, what's possible and what's plausible widens and you, and you begin to realize, wow, you know, it might just be possible that that could that could happen. And the idea that there could, in fact, be some form of higher technology in ancient times that we can't even conceive of today because it's on some whole different level. Another approach, another vector, another paradigm as far as how you know we're based on the linear thought of, you know, combustible fuel and limited mm-hmm. scarcity energy that's not renewable and th- everything run by electrodynamos created by Tesla, I mean, which are not bad, but there might be other ways we could do this. I mean, is this really the best we can come up with? I don't well, think I mean, so. If you think about it, <laughs> there's people alive today who, when they were born, the telegraph was the main communication device. And so it's not been that long ago that telegraphs were, you know, what you use to get information out. And just the whole idea now, I could pick up an iPhone, go on Skype, and I could talk to someone in China, Russia, Australia, r- while I'm riding the bus. I mean, that would have been considered sci-fi when I was a kid. That's like, oh, you've been reading Dick Tracy comics and, on Sunday. And, and to try to realize that the next stage of this kind of thing, I mean, if, if you look at all the intelligence services, predictions for you know 50 years from now, will be that you won't even need these things. You'll have these things wired into you. And, you know, what then? I mean, if, if suddenly someone came – from the ancient times and saw people, they'd think they were all uh, telepathic. But there'd be no evidence really to be able to find out how they communicated with, with each other if you happen to find the body or something. I'll have to say this, though. The one thing I think a lot of people think in their minds is if you had an advanced civilization during Noah's time, where is it today? Why haven't they uncovered it? You said the thing about the silt covering over. Now, by the time this plays, maybe someone's found it, but – in a time when you can track a cell phone anywhere on Earth, how can you lose a whole plane that had over 200 people who all had cell phones 
when you had satellites and other and GM, um, oh not GMO, duh, uh, GPS trackers, and you know you got the whole world looking all over to try to find an airplane that I guess would have crashed fairly recently with all these trackers. Then try to find a civilization that has been buried under who knows how many thousands of of feet of sediment. Yeah, I mean, Michael, let's be honest. I anybody that would want to naysay or debunk based on that kind of retort is it's just not even almost not worth arguing because I know, well, for example, when the tsunami hit Indonesia several years ago, the huge, you know, loss of life and everything, the tragedy of all that. Well, what happened in that situation was is the bottom of the Indian Ocean fell out. And when it fell out, the ocean dropped down into the fallout, the bottom of the sea, you know. And when that happened, the, the shore receded back from, say, like the shore of India. And the people who lived in the cities on the shore of India, when that happened, all of a sudden the water just receded for a couple miles to where, like, the whole entire harbor of this ancient area, which had, the city had been there for a couple thousand years, was ex suddenly exposed to the air for the first time in thousands of years. And what they saw right away was a giant ruined city looking back at them with like blocks the size of small cars tossed about like kids, kids toys and nobody living in that city that was looking at that knew where that other city came from. There was no account of it. And so that means the city that they were all in was a couple thousand years old. So that city that they were looking at, the ruins of, that nobody knew what it was, well, had to have been thousands of years before that. Mm -hmm. And yet there it was, sitting right there in the harbor. And as soon as the waves crashed back over, it was gone. <laughs> you know? Because it's uh, under a couple miles of water or whatever. Or not a couple of miles, but hundreds yeah. of feet of water at that point, you know? And so, if, you watch, if you watch that show, um, they played on history before history turned into like ponds, shops, and and cars and stuff. Uh, they, military, they had, military weapons. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they had a show on that was like called uh, Earth Population Zero. And I think a lot of people have this image that if suddenly civilization ended thousands of years in the future, you'd still be able to walk through the ruins of New York or something. And in reality, aside from things like uh, Mount Rushmore and the pyramids, which of course, you know, the pyramids have big blocks and Rushmore is carved into granite. Almost every single sign of human activity would decompose within less than a thousand years. New York would, they showed a picture, New York would look like it did back when, you know, it was founded, you know, when the Europeans came to it. I mean, it would not be all these buildings sticking up and stuff. So, and that's only over the course of a thousand years. So cities where you find the big blocks, that's all that you would really expect to have left. Everything else would be gone. Totally. And I've heard theories now they're coming out with people who are, have written papers now talking about our whole way of dating, like the different periods of time going back to dinosaurs and before is totally off that based on these new catastrophism type uh, uh, parameters, you find that the, what we considered fossilization may have been at the aftermath of floods. Not the pressure of rocks pressing over whatever amount of time, but the sudden flooding of an entire continent with water and it being, you know, everything got laid underneath a big, thick layer of mud and silt and that hardened and there's your fossilization. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is what I'm, you know, I'm excited about the idea of exploring alternatives because I've never bought, you know, when I was a small child, the whole the Freighter X was born in the wonder that you said of questioning authority. You know, the whole idea of a uh, <clears throat> young Freighter X in school sat in the class and said, hey, you know, this teacher is putting all this stuff out like it's gospel. But I can go to the library and bring this other book into school tomorrow, which I did, that says the contrary in a better way, more eloquently and with lots more citations and mm -hmm. footnotes. So <laughs> therefore, who's right? You know, and like I realized the teacher was a fraud. The teacher, in fact, did not have the greater uh, interests of the students in mind, you know, that they were, in fact, uh, just trying to present civic mythology as already preconceived and predetermined by the state, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't about really educating people and teaching them how to think. And so the, the, that from you move forward from that. So I'm really excited by people who come forward with new and innovative ideas 
And getting back to the topic of our discussion with Noah, the reason why this is uh, so important is because it's what's not being said. You know, look at what's not being said in the scripture. Yet we know that in the New Testament, Jesus mentions Enoch 40 times at least in the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Yet it, yet. The book of Enoch was excised from the Bible. <laughs> yeah. So what's going on there? Why? Why? Well, when you look at the closely at the scripture, just like the books of the Maccabees. You ever heard of those books, but Maccabees 1 and 2? I think well, I've heard of it, but that's only in a historical context, not in the Bible. Well, they are biblical books. In the, in the Catholic Bible, they're there. And in other Bibles, the Jerusalem Bible has them too. But in the Protestant Bible, they're not there. Same with Baruch. Baruch in the Protestant Bible is not there. Yet, so these books, why aren't they there? Well, the Maccabees is the story of the people rising up and revolting against the bankers and the priesthood and taking over. So I wonder why they excised that. <laughs> they took that out of the King James Version because they didn't want to give the, the paupers any ideas, I think, Michael. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I mean, I mean how, how blind a lot of people are now. I mean, if you take a look at I mean, and I want to get back to uh, one of the major points here, uh, but First, the the thing is that most of your, you know, you talk about the stoning of the prophets. You talk about the persecution and ultimately Jesus being crucified. There being all this hardship that was being placed on God's people was the fact that they were, they were actually going against the system. They were revolting. They were breaking the law. And now you've got all these preachers and their big, beautiful cathedrals with their 6,000 people showing up and their, you know, and nice cars parked out in front. And there's, and the, it seems like they, the only thing they want to talk about is Romans 13 that is mistranslated, you know, when it, or misinterpreted and saying that, no, 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 you must never question authority. You must do what you're king or, well, I mean, we're almost getting back to those days where, you know, where people are expected to, you know, when if the king says we need to go to war, well, that's what God wants us to do. It seems like that's that's where Protestantism is going right now. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a whole. We could have a whole other show about that, my friend, because there's <laughs> a lot to be said on that. I, I completely agree that the emphasis is is lost in this in the modern day uh churches of, of the world but especially of america is what i can really speak to and the message of christianity that's still there i mean there's still there's something to be said but it's just totally been uh the focus is totally lost it's totally re-emphasized on what you said render unto caesar you know what i mean it's all about what's rendered on caesar but back to the point of what's not being said okay what's not being said with regards to the story of noah and the Nephilim and all this, because it's all interrelated. That's what people don't realize. The reason why I wanted to come on the show today is to talk about what people. Noah, the story of Noah is completely connected to the fallen angels and to Nephilim. That's what it's all about. But the way that they rearrange the scripture in the Old Testament, you lose the focus of that. In the true <clears throat> timeline of the material that we would have to review, these other books, the Book of Enoch, Jasher, Jubilees, and Noah, would have been in the material. So you would see the perspective of, of 1,196 years of defiling and infiltration by the, by the fallen ones. And then eventually by their offspring, the Nephilim, who make up the, the giants, monsters, and quote-unquote heroes or men of renown, which to me represents like Theseus, Perseus, Hercules. These are the characters that you would think of as the, in this time frame. So, hybrids. you know, hybrids, you know, that are like half half human and half God, quote unquote, of the gods, divine, right? And and so, and even uh, Gilgamesh himself was one. He was 10 feet tall. His mother was a goddess and his father was a king. You know, that's the story. And so, and in the story of Gilgamesh, if anybody remembers, Gilgamesh and his buddy Enkidu, they go and they visit Noah, who's still alive, living at the edge of the river that leads to the, the launching place of the gods where the ro the fiery rockets are. So, you know, Noah's still alive at the time when Gil so it Gilgamesh comes along and he's going to talk to him. And go ahead. I was going to say, then, I you were then say something. if we assume then that, I mean, I'm just assuming myself. I mean, I, I but at least in, in my fictional novel, I placed the flood at 12,500, uh, 10,500 BC that Noah didn't die when he was 600. He may have died thousands of years later. 
according to the Sumerian, he never died. He was he was he was he he was allowed to just remain with them, you know, like near their spot, and like him and his wife just hung out there, and they didn't die. Wow. So, because because think about it, uh, Gilgamesh was from like one thousand one hundred and something in BC, and you're talking about ten thousand two hundred BC, the time of the flood. So he was still alive, like eight thousand years later. Well, you know? I mean, hey, you know, I mean, we have scientists today saying it's possible. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let me well, ask you a question here: the secret okay. societies. Do you believe? I mean, again, in in the novel I did, in Noah's time, you'd have the upper echelon people, a genetic, genetically superior uh, bloodline, and they rule over the other people. Um, but the genetically enhanced, you know, not enhanced, but the genetically advanced or eugenic society, they maintain religion. They have very strong spirituality, but they promote atheism amongst the commoners. They uh, and with just rituals in their various temples. Now, is some of the things that we're talking about here intentionally hidden? I mean, are there secret societies you feel that keep people in the dark as to the the true nature of this golden age of humanity? Oh, totally. Uh, I think that most of the orders that I've come into contact with or studied or researched the and membership that I've had conversations with debriefed interviewed things of this nature most people have no clue of the correlated what we're talking about the ideas like I kind of started at the beginning of the show talking about how the noahic tradition is found within a lot of these orders think about it everybody why is building why is the idea of the builders a craft of architecture and stuff so so focused upon in like freemasonry and and these other fraternal orders that are based on the same principles of freemasonry and traditions of freemasonry why is that such a huge focus and when you look back to you trace it back to sources and time period you find the traditions are all going back to the time of noah and the time of the flood when they're talking about the the pseudo history of the orders and stuff like this and for example example, Anderson's Constitution of Freemasonry takes you back to the time of the flood. And then, of course, back to the time of Adam and Seth. But here's the point. After a flood that would happen to wipe out all civilization, wouldn't builders become extremely important people in your culture? Because they can rebuild. <laughs> they have the knowledge to rebuild the structures that have been destroyed. So suddenly the idea of building and building tools and architecture and the knowledge and science that's geometry and, you know, calculus and all these things become very important and become almost mystical in their power to rebuild not just the physical aspects of our culture and society, but the ideological aspects, the tapping into that long tradition of the greatness that makes up humanity going back to ancient traditions of Egypt and Sumer and, you know, further back and how it connects it all together in this like majestic expansive view of humanity being able to accomplish great feats in architecture and, and structural buildings. So you can see how this would all become very important to a people that were surviving a great cataclysm to rebuild, you know, and, and when you connect with that, the idea that, as I've said in the past, I believe we'd covered this in the last show that we spoke about. I really believe that early on that there, there were, you know, like a light and dark side, like in Star Wars, there were two schools of approach to esoteric reality, to what could be called metaphysical reality or magic or spirituality or whatever you want to call it. But that whole unseen phenomenon that goes on around us, that connecting however you want to describe it. But I believe there was two schools of approach that, that sort of rose up in human tradition that, 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 appro that began to... Uh, provide a way, a systematized way for individual, a, ser a, a pattern of behavior that would make the most of consciousness enmeshed in reality as it is in our world and the three-dimensional reality we exist in. And so one side of that school was one which would actually want to help liberate people, to bring them to their fullest potential, to get them to the realization of what they could accomplish. You know? and, the, and the other side would be one in which they were bound or held and captivated, you know, held captive by the the uh, uh, 
beings that would exploit others and that would draw their, and drain their power and, and to, for their own needs and their own uh, purposes. And I think that we have sort of like a Promethean type effect. That there were some beings, watchers maybe, or fallen ones, or however we want to call it, that came down that may have had more egalitarian notions about humanity that may have actually wanted to help. Like Prometheus stole the fire from the gods and gave it to the humans, you know? And that they may make up those entities that were offering insights and, and systems of approach that were that could be beneficial. But there were just as many, if not more, darker intended beings, fallen ones, that still plague humanity to this day, I believe, and that have uh, engaged in a, a millennial-long struggle to over, overtake and undo the light side, the good that humans are capable of. Mm -hmm. Kind of like what the Muslims call the jinn and so forth. Absolutely. Connected to that same, you know, all, every culture has it. That's, you make a good point with all cultures. You find different traditions being described. I mean, every culture from the Plains Indians to the Asiatic cultures, to the Nor Norse cultures, to mm -hmm. it's just through all of them. You know, it's now here, clear. here may be the most controversial question I'm going to ask you. <laughs> most people feel when they, when they read scriptures and stuff that Noah and his family were the only survivors of the flood. Um, there's some traditions that Noah had more than one wife, you know, and maybe there was more people in that boat than than are described. But nevertheless, whatever his whatever his family survives. But wouldn't it also be possible? It sounds like this maybe what you're saying. You correct me if I'm wrong. There were other survivors in areas that did not get wiped out by the flood, but these would have been very primitive people. These would have been people that would not have had this golden age civilization. Is the whole thing with bloodlines you hear about, you know, these Illuminati things and stuff like this, do these people see that they're descended from Noah, but maybe other groups of people aren't? Yeah, Michael, I don't think it's all clean cut and dry, cut and dry and black and white as everybody would like to think. Like, you know, I laugh a lot of times at people who are extremely racist because I feel I, I'm, I, I find it remarkable and that anybody could take a racist stance and not feel sort of like a hypocrite or, or kind of like a silly person because they there's no way of, of attaining anything like racial purity. I mean, it's just impossible, right? And then, and then combine that with what you're saying. Okay, yeah, let's talk about the Noah tradition. Noah tradition says that they're the only ones left. And yet when they get off the ark, there are eventually other people around you know what i mean i mean they come into contact with them and of course we know that not everyone died in the flood people went underground they went up high on mountains people survived we know in the and we know that giants survived too we know that giants who were in fact according to scripture the nephilim the giants are the offspring of the watchers the fallen angels so the giants they talk about in scripture are nephilim and if we are to read the the extra jewish tradition of the books of enoch and all the other ones i've mentioned if we are to read them with any kind of veracity they're telling us the flood happened to wipe the earth of the offspring of the fallen angels and humanity and all the defiling of humanity that went on which means the giants were part of the plan to be wiped out but they obviously weren't because in the time of joshua in the time of the scripture after moses when joshua takes over and leads the israelites into the promised land the land of canaan the first thing we hear about is that there's giants all over the place and that they have to go in there and wipe them out and that's very interesting to me. Of course, Canaan, the land of Canaan in and of itself, ge geographically, is very interesting because Canaan is really where Tyre is, the city of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, or Tyre, right? So the, the Hiram, the king of Tyre, is an integral part of the Masonic ritual, and he sends Hiram Abiff, the craftsman, the copper metal worker, to King Solomon to be the master craftsman to build the temple of God's abode on earth. Okay. Why is that so important? Well, because if you look back in cultural history, that land of Canaan and Tyre and all that area, that's where Tubal Cain was the, to the totem God of that area. And Tubal Cain was the metallurgist. He's Vulcan in Roman lore. 
Okay, Vulcan, the god Vulcan, fire god who has all these like little demonic hobbits for minions around him, right? Tubal Cain is the patron god, not only of metallurgy, but also of Freemasonry. And he's mentioned in the ritual extent. His name is a very important name. So, okay, so Tubal Cain connection, yep. Yeah. King Hi Hiram, King uh, Hiram sends Hiram of Tyr, the uh, Hiram of Biff. He goes to there. Well, here's another connection. Joseph. In the scripture, the husband of Mary was Joseph of Tyr. He was from Tyr. He was supposedly descended from Hiram of Biff, another craftsman. And why is that all interesting in connection? Well, the word craftsman or builder in the original New Testament, which was written in Greek, anybody who doesn't realize that, it wasn't written in Hebrew first. It was written in Greek. It was written in Cohen Greek. And the original Hebrew or the original Greek term for craftsman is tekton. T-E-K-T-O-N, tekton. That means crafter or build. That's where they get carpenter from. That's the word that they translated into carpenter. But it means builder or craftsman. Well, why is that remarkable? Because in Greece today, in colloquial spoken Greece, Greek language, they call Freemasons tectons today. So that's just a strange little coincidence, I think, in connection of, uh, you know, that's the way my mind works with these things, Michael. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, it, it, it does sound like that if they make such a big deal about Noah, then maybe they believe, whether it's true or not, that they believe that they are of Noah's bloodline, but maybe – other people's aren't maybe you know and, and i don't know maybe well, wait michael michael that's great i'm glad you brought that up you brought me back on task back on the point here yeah the bloodlines why the pre why the over preoccupation with bloodlines bl racial purity genetics you hear i mean i was contacted during my time broadcasting on american freedom radio the last three years i was contacted by individuals who claim to be connected to an ancient court connected to royal families of europe who said they could trace their bloodline back to these original like you know the high priests of the temple and back to babylon you know and it, it was remarkable to me i'm like very curious as to how they pull this off because i don't know of these tests that they supposedly have that they could do this with right number one but number two it, it is this overemphasis on uh uh, you know, thinking that, you know, we need to have the special elite bloodline and they will fulfill our destiny or, or whatever. You see it. I mean, hum humanity has been caught up in the notion of a people rising up to rule over all the rest forever, it seems. I mean, the scripture itself, the, the Bible is a manual. Well, I have a very old friend of mine who... who passed away and he 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 was fond of of pointing out to me that the scripture was in fact uh, a, a series of accounts of failures uh in an attempt by people to live in accordance with god's will as they understood it and he's like i i would never follow the bible he said because that's just a, a series of examples of failures if you follow the people that they do it in the Bible there, you're going to fail like they did. <laughs> well, but, you know, there's really some wisdom to what he was saying. I mean, I had to stop and think about it. I was like, you know, that's really true. <laughs> I never thought about that. But really, yeah. in a way, it's kind of true. Yeah. You know, this is really interesting. I'm going to have to have you back on in the future. <laughs> the um, We've got just a few seconds left. Uh, can you tell people where to find your website? <laughs> yeah, excuse me. Um, first of all, you can go to Facebook and find the Middle Chamber page on Facebook. And we're also we're about to broadcast from now on. We're going to be at the end of the month doing SyncBook Radio Network at thesyncbook.com. That's where you'll find the Middle Chamber broadcasting weekly. Uh, we'll have a podcast release on Saturday nights at 9 p.m. Central Time, so 10 p.m. on the East Coast of America. And my website is Middle Chamber. The, the letters fx.wordpress.com. You can also find me at the blog, uh, which is freighterx.blogspot.com. And there's FreighterX and MaderX, my co-host, my wife, MaderX. She is also involved in all this. And you, we have our, a joint Facebook page at FreighterX and MaderX. Well, I hope people will check that up. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, keep up the good work there in informing people of these ancient mysteries and uh, knowledge that seems to be just hidden, but still it's something we can find. Thank you, Michael, for having me on. And one more thing I'd like to mention is uh, next month, uh, April 4th, 
Freighter X and Mater X will be appearing at Brave New Books in Austin, Texas for the release of my new DVD, which is called The Secret War on Human Consciousness. So uh, anybody who could make it, that'd be great. But otherwise, <laughs> you could uh, just to keep in mind uh, that after that date, the, that DVD will be available in all the places that we've already mentioned. Excellent. I encourage people to go there. Anyway, well, I got to quickly wrap up here. Um, thank you for coming on. And uh, thank you, all my listeners, for tuning in to Unlock the Door Radio. Take care and have a great week. Bye now. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>